Last time, we left Seleucus in Babylon, and Antigonus laying siege to Eumenes' fortress at Nora. Antigonus continued his siege for over a year, until, suddenly, word came that Antipater was dead. He had died of an illness, aggravated by his advanced age, being 81, and willed the regency to Polyperchon, who had been the governor of Macedonia under him. Antipater passed over his son Cassander, who as previously mentioned was currently head of the Companions, due to him being deemed too young, at 36, to be regent. But he was named as Kiliarch. Cassander did not take this well, and began a plot to seize power, gathering his close allies and writing letters seeking the support of many of the major figures of the Empire. Foreseeing that he would soon be needed elsewhere, Antigna sent an envoy to Eumenes, offering to end the siege, so long as he would take an oath to Antigonus personally. Eumenes tricked a gullible envoy into allowing him to take an oath to the kings of Macedon instead, and, once the siege was broken, fled with his men. Antigonus was furious at this, but pursuing Eumenes was not his top priority, for Cassander had come to him personally and sought his aid in the revolt against Polyperchon. Antigonus saw this as an opportunity to distract the regent and consolidate his own hold over Asia Minor, and perhaps even more, so he happily outfitted Cassander with an army and a navy. Polyperchon, in turn, wrote to Eumenes and promised him control of the royal army, including the shield bearers and the veteran silver shields, and named him as supreme commander in Asia. Thus, in 318 BC, the empire descended immediately into another civil war. Meanwhile, in the east, Python, who had become the satrap of Media, sought to take advantage of the turmoil. He invaded the neighbouring satrapy of Parthia, slew the previous satrap, and then installed his brother into the position. This was not taken lightly by the rest of the eastern satraps, who raised a combined army led by Pukestas, the satrap of Persis. Python was defeated in battle, and fled back to Media, and thereafter went to Babylon to seek the support of his semi-retired old comrade Seleucus. While this was happening, Antigonus had secured his western flank, with his navy seizing control of the Aegean. After this, he turned to deal with Eumenes, who had gathered an army of some 18,000 men in Phoenicia. Eumenes, being forewarned, knew that he could not yet match Antigonus in open battle, so he marched his men eastwards in an attempt to secure the loyalty of the satraps there, who had not yet joined the fray. Eumenes came into Babylonia and encamped there, sending emissaries to Seleucus and Python. These emissaries were rebuffed, albeit politely, and so Eumenes sought to continue on further east to Susa. In return, Seleucus and Python sent their own emissary to Antigones, the commanding officer of the Silver Shields, who they had served with under Perdiccas, and who had been involved in the conspiracy with them to assassinate the regent. They asked him and his men to switch sides, but this request was refused. Seleucus and Python then sailed down the Tigris, to where the army was encamped, and tried to persuade the men not to follow Eumenes, as he was not a Macedonian by blood, and through his war had killed their fellow Macedonians. But this effort also failed. Seleucus then made an attempt to prevent Eumenes from crossing the Tigris, by breaking open a dam and inundating Eumenes' camp. But some locals assisted Eumenes, and directed him in digging a channel to change the course of the wayward water. Panicked, Seleucus sent envoys to propose a truce, while sending letters to Antigonus, imploring him to come with his army at once. But Eumenes reached Susa, and found waiting there the combined eastern army that had earlier been assembled to fight Python, numbering about 25,000 men and 120 war elephants, which joined forces with him. Hearing of this, Antigonus, who was presently in Mesopotamia, slowed his pursuit in order to enlarge his own army. When his forces reached Babylon, both Seleucus and Python joined their armies to his, and set off with him after Eumenes. They then advanced into Susania. There he appointed Seleucus satrap of the province, provided him with troops, and left him in charge of besieging Susa, the capital, which was presently being defended by Xenophilus, who was the supervisor of the royal treasury there. It seems this siege did not last long, and was likely concluded through diplomatic means, as Xenophilus would switch his allegiance to Seleucus and the Antigonid faction. Seleucus, taking control of the city, then sent the bulk of his men to reinforce Antigonus. While this had been happening, 
Antigonus had moved onto the river Coprates, known today as the River Des, and began sending his men across on pontoons. The men who crossed over were not expecting immediate battle, and so were foraging for food while they waited for the others to cross. Eumene suddenly appeared with a small force and attacked the disorganized Antigonid men, taking 4,000 as captives and driving the rest back into the river where they drowned, while Antigonus watched helplessly from the far bank. Changing tack, Antigonus decided to march north to Ecbatana. En route, he was continually harassed by local Cossayan mountain tribes, who Python had advised him in vain to bribe. Reaching their destination, Python went out and gathered another 2,000 horsemen to replenish their force. It was around this time that the detachment sent by Seleucus must have met back up with the main body of the army. Once they had recovered from their recent ordeals, the Antigonid army set off for Persis, and Eumenes marched to meet them. Their armies came within a day's march of each other, and for five days they each drew up for battle. But neither side would attack for they were each in a strong defensive position, surrounded by ravines and rivers. However, the land was barren, and soon each army had exhausted much of its supplies, forcing them to either do battle or move on. On the sixth day, they both set out south for the region of Gebeni to quarter there. Eumenes made a head start, so Antigonus put Python in charge of the army and personally led 2,000 cavalry as fast as he could to catch up to his old enemy. Once he came into sight of Eumenes' rearguard, the royalists assumed that the whole of Antigonus' army must be near, and so drew up their army for battle. Python soon arrived with the main body of the Antigonid army, and they too prepared for battle. Eumenes' army numbered 35,000 infantry, 6,100 cavalry, and 114 elephants, while Antigonus had 28,000 infantry, 8,500 cavalry, and 65 elephants. Trumpets were sound and battle was joined. Python attacked on the left flank with his cavalry, but they were routed and chased off the battlefield. In the centre, the phalanxes of both armies met, but it was the veteran Silver Shields, by now men in their 60s and 70s, who broke their opponents and began to pursue them. The situation was now looking desperate for Antigonus, and some of his officers advised him to withdraw. Instead, he took his cavalry and charged into a gap created by the pursuit of Eumenes' phalangites. He attacked the enemy troops on the left wing who had been pursuing Python and routed them, while rallying his own men. Eumenes, seeing this, sounded his trumpets and withdrew his men. The two sides now had a chance to organise themselves, and they formed back up into lines in preparation for another round, now under a full moon. However, by the time the forces were ready, it was midnight, and the exhausted armies both retired. Though Eumenes had inflicted greater casualties, the battle was inconclusive. The next day, the Antigonids buried their dead at dawn. When an envoy from the royalists came to ask permission to do the same, Antigonus held him for most of the day, only sending him back to Eumenes in the evening, with instructions to bury the dead on the following day. As soon as night fell, the Antigonid army made a forced march away from the battlefield. Eumenes made no attempt to pursue, but stayed to bury his dead. Winter of 316 was approaching fast, so each side withdrew to their quarters for the season. While this had been going on, Cassander had captured Macedonia and declared himself the new regent, before moving south into the Peloponnese to secure the rest of Greece. Olympias, the mother of Alexander, was concerned about the position of her grandson, Alexander IV, so she resolved to return to Macedonia from a native Epirus. Queen Eurydice, in fear of this, sent a letter to Cassander, imploring him to come to her aid. But before he could, Olympias had arrived, taken charge of the Macedonians, who were loyal to her as Alexander's mother, and imprisoned Philip III and Eurydice, torturing and later killing them, leaving her young grandson as the sole king. Cassander's army returned to Macedonia, and Olympias fled to the city of Pydna, taking Alexander IV and his mother Roxana with her. Cassander followed and laid siege to the city. Polyperkin was unable to come to her aid due to how few loyal soldiers he had left to him. Cassander gradually starved out the city and Olympias attempted to escape by sea, but was foiled. After this, she surrendered herself to Cassander so long as he guaranteed her safety. 
Still deeming Olympias as a potential threat, Cassander had her executed, and then took custody of Alexander IV and Roxana. Back in Asia, Antigonus wanted to seize the initiative in the war by launching a surprise attack on the royalist army. However, Eumenes was able to thwart all of Antigonus' attempts at subterfuge, and the two armies ended up once again drawn up for battle. The armies were deployed similarly to their previous battle, with the infantry in the centre and the cavalry on the wings. Python again took the left flank, while Antigonus and his young son Demetrius took the right. Eumenes eagerly began his attack with his cavalry and elephants. Now, the ground of the battlefield was a salt flat, and when the cavalry charged across it, huge amounts of dust were kicked up, which made seeing anything very difficult. This gave Antigonus an idea, and he immediately dispatched part of his cavalry to travel completely around the enemy army. He then charged into the fray on his own horse, and the battle was joined. Fighting was fierce, horseman against horseman, elephant against elephant, and though Eumenes' men fought bravely, Antigonus had more cavalry at his disposal, and gradually began to win on the flanks. In the centre, the silver shields fought impressively, and once again routed the Antigonid infantry, inflicting onto them substantial losses. However, the cavalry which Antigonus had sent out at the start of the battle now had reached their goal undisturbed, the royalist baggage train, which contained their supplies, their families, and all of their belongings. While the royalist infantry had been victorious, they now found themselves in a bind, for they had lost their families and property to the enemy. Having finally seen this threat, Eumenes ordered his second-in-command, Bukestas, to counterattack with his cavalry, but his subordinate refused, and instead retired for the day. That night, Eumenes and the other satraps joined the rest of the army, and discussed their next moves, but they could come to no agreement. Teutimus, second-in-command of the Silver Shields, sent a message to Antigonus to negotiate for the release of their baggage. Antigonus offered it to them in exchange for Eumenes, and the deal was accepted, with the Silver Shields pledging him their loyalty. Eumenes was seized and given over to Antigonus. There would be no miraculous escape for him this time, and he was put to death. Antigonus also split up the Silver Shields and scattered them across the easternmost provinces of the Empire, where they would be sent on deadly assignments, so they would bother him no more. Antigonus himself was thrown into a pit and burnt alive. An ignominious end for such a celebrated unit of men. Pukestas, who had famously saved Alexander's life in India, and was now the satrap of Persis, was not killed, but he had his satrapy taken away from him, and was replaced with a puppet of Antigonus, backed up by a substantial garrison. Now victorious, and effectively the master of Asia, Antigonus had very few rivals, so he started to turn on his allies. He became convinced Python was arranging a conspiracy against him, or at least used such a claim as a pretext, and so had him executed. The fact that Python controlled a substantial and strategically important province makes it seem like an awful convenience for Antigonus. After all, Python would have been somewhat short-sighted to plan a revolt while Antigonus and his whole army were within his domain, rather than waiting until the general returned west, as he inevitably would do. However, the execution did then drive many of Python's loyal subordinates into a revolt against Antigonus, who bloodily suppressed the uprising. Antigonus then began putting new men, loyal personally to him, in charge of most of the eastern satrapies. After this he marched for Susa, and on the way was met by Xenophilus the treasurer, who had been sent by Seleucus to serve Antigonus. Arriving at the city, he collected the contents of the treasury and moved on. Next he arrived in Babylon, where Seleucus put on magnificent feasts for the whole army, and gave out fine gifts. At some point during the stay, Seleucus caused some sort of slight against one of Antigonus's other officers, which prompted Antigonus to demand an accounting of all of Seleucus's revenues and possessions, which he refused to provide. Tensions grew greater and greater over the following days, and it seems like Antigonus was once again using a flimsy pretext to eliminate a member of Alexander's old guard and bring in one of his own men to govern Babylon. Seleucus, being well aware of what had just happened to his old comrade Python, fled the city on horseback, heading for the court of Ptolemy in Egypt. 
At first, Antigonus was pleased that he had gained the rich city without any struggle. But then a group of local astrologers came to him, informing him of a prophecy that, if Seleucus escaped, he would become the lord of Asia, and Antigonus would die in battle with him. Antigonus then sent out men after Seleucus, but Seleucus was aided by Bletor, the satrap of Mesopotamia, and made his escape. Antigonus had Bletor deposed. Seleucus was warmly welcomed in Egypt by his old comrade Ptolemy. Seleucus warned him of Antigonus's megalomaniacal behaviour, his systematic elimination of the veterans of Alexander, and his great consolidation of power and wealth into his own hands. Seleucus also told Ptolemy that he believed Antigonus had designs to make himself the ruler of all of the Macedonian Empire. This deeply concerned Ptolemy, who immediately wrote to the remaining great commanders of the Empire, Cassander in Macedon, and Lysimachus in Thrace. They shared in his concern, so an alliance was made between them, and they readied themselves for war. Hearing of these moves, Antigonus wrote to them, asking for continued friendship. The response from the other governors was, that if he desired friendship, he should divide up between them all the lands and spoils gained from his victory over Eumenes, as they had all fought together in that war. Antigonus treated this demand with scorn, and bade them to prepare for war. Next time we will see the eruption of yet another war, with Seleucus taking the fight personally to his former ally Antigonus. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, please post them below, and thank you for listening.